Um, my name, as I think almost all of you know, is Kate Moss. Um, and uh, I'm a novelist, but more significantly in Chichester, I am the biographer of Chichester Festival Theatre, and I've been doing the pre-performance talks uh, for this wonderful season. Um, it's an enormous pleasure to have uh, Tim and Angus here tonight to talk about Neville's Island, which has its first night on Friday, so they're being very calm um, to be here on the set tonight. And what we're going to do, as always, is talk amongst ourselves for about 35 minutes and then just have a couple of questions at the end. So, um, I have here sitting in the middle is Tim Firth, um, who is the author of Neville's Island. And at the far corner, stage right, is Angus Jackson, who is an associate director of CFT. Um, you will have seen many of his productions here. And Angus, of course, is the director of Neville's Island. Um, I'm going to start with you, Tim, because sure. when I was preparing um, to come and do this, I was, I've got to be honest, rather intimidated in the fact that you had written this play when you were a mere stripling of a lad. It's about middle-aged men, middle management, middle of nowhere, yeah. office politics, but you had just come out of university pretty much and then wrote this play when you were in your <laughs> early 20s. So yeah. how did it come about? Um, uh, I think uh, the reason I wrote it about uh, the age that I wrote about was purely because it wouldn't have been funny had they not been... <laughs> at that point in their lives. And I didn't really realise that until I started writing. The, the whole reason the play came about was because um, I'd met Alan Akebourne in Scarborough. I'd written this one-act play for him, and he'd said, well, it's worked in the studio. Would you like to, to write something for the, the main house? Which, of course, you know, is in the round. And uh, in that sense of desperation, I just looked at the theatre and thought, round, uh, <laughs> island, uh, possibly. <laughs> and, and also... Uh, I, I'd had this vague idea. Uh, you sort of, it's funny as a writer, you, uh, I don't know, you may be the same, but you, there is a, a sort of mental fridge that you have, that you, things that you, you, you find you put away for a while and you, they may never come to anything or um, they, they may find their place and their time. And there was one idea I'd had about literally a wouldn't, wouldn't it be funny if idea. That's all it was which is, wouldn't it be funny if some people got shipwrecked in land? How would that happen? And I, I was given this theatre, this island, and I had that thing in the fridge, and the two sort of coalesced. And so everything that then happened, everything that, that, that appeared out of the mist, the, the, the characters, why they were there, what they found when they were there, what they found about themselves when they were there, all happened because of that single premise of, here's a theatre, it's round, <laughs> you have this idea about people getting shipwrecked in land, and that's the point. And that's a great start to, for, for me, because it means that the thing that's come first in the whole process has been that comic spark, that idea. Yeah. Not the theme. I couldn't write anything themed first. I couldn't write anything where I'd, I'd plotted mechanically out exactly what was going to happen to these guys. I sort of operate on a, on a, on a basis of knowing roughly that somewhere in the distance there is an Oz, and <laughs> where that yellow brick road is going to go, I Man have absolutely no idea. Yeah. Yes, I have no <laughs> idea what tin men I'm going to find on the road. And so that's where it started. So the whole idea of the discovery and, and the, the middle-aged nature of them was, was generated genuinely by what will make this funny. And that sense of slight being at a crossroads in life, the, the age sort of actually marvellous the age that I am now, that sense of... <laughs> I'm dangerously home to roost, but that sense of a point where you're looking around your life and seeing how far you've got and how far you've got to go seemed to be pivotal for the state of these four guys. And also, if, as I had, you've spent your life on your own, in a room, writing, <laughs> office work, office politics, that's just like Narnia. That's, that's a different world. <laughs> that, and, and yeah, yes, it is yes. hugely exotic because I'd never done it. I'd never held a briefcase in my life. And, uh, and so, it's, 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 for me, it's like writing about Knights of the Round Table. It's just... and does that mean that when, once they start, you started to have the idea that it was going to be the, the, mm. these four men and you realised they needed to be middle-aged for, mm. uh, for the way the story needed to develop, that you had to then go and do some research? Or was it because it's on the island and not in the office, that not really matter? It was the type of person... No, the, the office side of it needed no research because, of course, you, it was set on the island the, and the, the, the areas that needed research simply were what happens on these kind of team-building exercises. Um, Had you ever done one? I, I'd, I'd, yes, I've been part of one, partly uh, 
because a television series that I was writing at the time had an episode where it was about the Territorial Army and the Territorial Army run these kind of courses yeah. for these businesses. And I can remember standing at the side, I wasn't doing it, watching these guys petrified being forced to cross rivers with <laughs> on oil drums and uh, thinking, what, what da emotional damage is this wreaking on people? But actually, uh, that, that motion, the, the look on the people's faces at the time was one of the, the major kind of characteristics that, that, that things that I was then able to import into the writing of it. Um, but what it's about, what happens on the island, that kind of research is intangible because it's what it's what you, what you've watched your entire life. Mm. You sit and watch and, and absorb. And it's funny, you know. Uh, but people will often you often see written, written at the start of plays these massive screeds about what the character is and. And especially when you're writing films, the, the, the movie companies will want will say, what is this guy? Who is he? And you'll write prose. And that, that has always mystified me. I could never understand how, you know, you, the writing prose depictions of characters is so frightening yeah. and <laughs> so off-putting. Whereas as soon as you just let people speak, just give them, just write them half a page of dialogue and you'll find out who they are without realising it. Because all the stuff that you've absorbed osmotically through your experience of working with and knowing people and friends of friends, that's who starts to emerge as this yeah, weird right. synthesis. And, and did you um, think it needs to be four, it needs to be an equal number or an odd number, or again, did they just, if you like, come out of the wings for you? They, uh, the, the play wrote itself in that way, they came out of the wings, that you, that there was a certain number and any more would have been wrong and any less would have been wrong. And, um, you have to trust because those things. Because of the power balances? I don't, know. I, yeah, I don't know, there is a... I put it all down to music in the end. I put everything down to music. I think everything can be defined by music, and it's that intangible that suddenly in this space, that musically felt the right number of instruments to have. Yeah. And it, uh, that it was a quartet, it, and it wouldn't have worked with anything else. It would have been too busy or too underpopulated. And I really trust that. You know, I really trust the things that, that I feel are kind of coming through me rather than I've sat down and poured over, which is why I don't plan. I think it's partly the reason that I, I you know, I plan my planning as little as I possibly can, and then just let things let things run, and uh, not so broadly. You do. I, I think a lot and write quickly. So you think a lot about these characters. You think a lot about who they are, and then so that hopefully then when you let them go, when you let them free, they have space to run, but always within a prescribed limit. They're not going to if they disappear off in ways that you weren't expecting. It means that you haven't really got a grasp of who they are. Um, and so I, they, they landed on this island and they started to speak and I just wrote it as quickly as I could and wrote as quickly as I could to, to hope that, 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 that they, they generated their own story and generated mm. their own It's a wonderful dynamic. thing in the script that you have uh, an explanation in the, uh, the Birmingham script, which is the yeah, one I've one. got, about how um, certain lines need to cut across yes. each other. Oh, God. And yeah. sort of that pace yes. is, is fantastic. That's vital. It's watching, really yeah. vital because... Half the time, what I love about language and I love about the way that language is used is that, again, it's musical. Sometimes there'll be... Uh, actors will say, what, why have you given me this? You know, because it's I, dash, and that's the speech. And so well, what's the point of that speech? And I said that the I is absolutely pivotal because without that little golf tee, the incoming line will not drive. It won't work. It's all about rhythm and... Uh, the, the, the point of interruptions of lines will be, you know, you can literally say, if it's interrupted there, it will work comedically. If it's interrupted two words later, it won't. Yeah. I have no idea why that is, but you can hear it musically. You can hear that that won't work. And so um, the, the viscerality of dialogue, and, the, and especially for comedy, I love that idea of it being instrumental, that people are talking over each other and they're saying things and they're, 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 they're doing what I'm doing now and finding, <laughs> uh, stumbling their way through. But actually... It's, it's harder to do. It's harder to make that kind of dialogue work than more prolix and more um, uh, poetic dialogue yeah, yeah. because, of course, it depends on everybody being a ball player. And everybody, all these, these guys, you'll see tonight, if you're going to see it, that actually there are points where everybody's talking and the, the art is that you should know exactly what we need you to know. That should be absolutely clear. But these guys have got to be so aware of what everybody else is doing because they are part of a speech that's got four players, you know, it's got four players around the net and, you know, without everybody knowing exactly where everybody else's lines are, it's the cumulative effect of that moment that we're after and that's a real hard thing to pull on. And, of course, I mean, there's, that's a 
Brilliant. Mm. Thank you. Segway into Angus, of course, obviously. Um, and I should have said the Olivier award-winning Angus wow. Jackson. I think this is very important. Yes. Um, now, Angus, you've d directed many different things for CFT in the Minerva, in the main house, and now here. Was um, Neville's Island a play you already knew? Is it something you'd been wanting to do? What's your relationship with it before you started to work on this production? Yeah, I saw it when I was a student. It was in the West End with Tony Slattery in, transferred from Nottingham, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge success story as a new play in the West End. So I think all, we all went to see it uh, when we were about, oh, I don't know, 19, 20. Um, because it was a new play in the West End, and that was relatively unusual, and I suppose because it was a funny play. So yeah, I think a lot of directors of my generation have had their eye on it as um, as a play to do. Mm. Uh, so it was it was a you know just like you talk about your your fridge as, as a writer, mm -hmm. Tim. You've got you've got all these plays that, given the opportunity, you go well. Yeah, actually, I, I'm interested in this. Now it's a play like this. You know, we you have to get the rights, and that's quite hard. So you need it, it's it's helpful to have a really good opportunity like like this um, theatre not allowed to call it a tent, whatever, you know, <laughs> theatre on the park, um, so that we could say, so it, it came together in that way. We knew we wanted to do a play as well as a musical in this venue. And so I sat down with Jonathan, and Jonathan knew the play very well and has produced it twice before, I think, once at Salisbury and once in Birmingham when he was running those two theatres. When I, and I was working with him at both of those theatres as an assistant in Salisbury and then as a freelance director in Birmingham. And we landed on it because we thought we could do this. Uh, and it, it seemed like a great opportunity. And we persuaded you um, that, 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 that it would work in this way. I mean, they say it's difficult to do comedy in the round or, or in, in a thrust space because you can't control in the same way. If you're in a proscenium arch, and you'll probably have an opinion about this, having done so much, but you can, it's easier to, to make the audience's eye travel to where you want it to travel. Whereas here, if we produce... Um, Okay, there are several, I won't do any spoilers, but there are several things that get produced in the play which, which are funny because they're, they're perhaps things that shouldn't be on an island. And you've got to reveal them to those people and those people and those people all at the same time to get one big laugh. So you spend ages tidging stuff around and tidging people around the stage so that they, they see what we see and that they see what those people see. So I've sort of segued slightly, haven't I? But yeah, it was, it, it was the opportunity plus knowing the play in the first place. And also, I mean, you know, just from you know, picking up from what you've just said, um, the way that you go backwards and forwards, one of the things I thought was so wonderful about the production, I saw it last night, yeah. was the sense that sometimes there were tableau, yeah. and so very clearly set, and there yeah. were, obviously, you had certain images in your mind that you were trying to get out to the audience, but when they're all talking across each other, that ability to make sure that we, the audience, is listening to the right man, yeah. not yeah. the wrong one. Because yeah. actually, we all have an affection for one of those four characters, I imagine. Yeah. So you tend, as if they're your child, yeah. to watch them. You know, I was watching Rufus Hound mm. at that point, and then I thought, well, I'm not supposed to be watching Rufus Hound at this moment, I'm supposed to be watching Aid Edmondson, you know? Mm. So, I mean, that is a real challenge, to get that right without it looking like mm. a, an iron fist mm. at the director around it, presumably. Well, you, yeah, you go from saying, just walk wherever you want and do whatever you want to the actors, because obviously they've got to have their head and they've got to uh, explore their characters in a, a, a similar but parallel version of the writing process. And you slowly, like, we, we, you know, one of the things that we learn as young directors is you're not allowed to say to people, do that because it'll be funny. You have to say, <laughs> do that because you desperately want the sausage because you haven't eaten for hours. And, and you can slowly segue into, into going... John, could you not move your left arm at that point because <laughs> Rufus is about to do something and I don't want everybody's eyes to flick across. And with good, experienced actors, mind you not, I mean, some of, these, uh, some of the actors in, in this company are very much more experienced than others, but fundamentally they're very, um, uh, uh, they've got a very good sense of their craft. You can get from who do you feel you are, how do you feel about being on an island, what do you think you want out of this moment, to... Uh, could you just not do that there? And instead, could you be one foot to the left? And you get to a point where they don't ask you why, which is great. <laughs> so, you, so you start, yeah, it's like marshalling animals in a way. <laughs> Let's hope the actors are not actually yet in the building. <laughs> Especially Rufus, if he's listening. Yes, exactly. Um, moving on to then how you cast it, it is a wonderful ensemble piece, because although there is a character called Neville, and mm -hmm. so you, one would imagine he'd be the lead because it's his island. Of course, it's not yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, the casting, therefore, of those four actors is essential. So do you say, I'd like this actor, that actor, or do you think, OK, I need a 
a certain sort of person. How did you go about casting this? And were you involved in it also, Tim? Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, yeah, we um, we met early on, so that um, then you know through email and calling and whatever, we didn't um, we didn't meet, we didn't audition anybody for this production, which I think is interesting because you always assume that what you do is you know I sit in a room and lots of actors come in, and it didn't work like that with this. We've got a wonderful casting director called Gabby Dawes, who's our associate casting director, and we started with just a list of actors who were funny and comedians who could act. So, because I think with the, they, need a, they need that skill, probably, to do it. Because, you know, the subject matter of this play could be very serious, could be very funny. I, I think the great achievement of the, of the play as a piece of writing is that it's both. But if you had non-funny people in it, it probably wouldn't work in the way that, it's, that it is working. So, yeah, we had acts who are funny comedians who could act. And we just had one list to begin with. We didn't have a Gordon list and an Angus list. And, and then I think a lot of it was, was us. And when I say us, a lot of it was you. I'd phone up Tim and go, OK, this actor is around and in the frame. I think he's maybe either a Gordon or an Angus. Or, well, it was never, there's no, nobody was ever a Gordon or an Angus. But, no. And you'd say, oh, Roy. I think that one's a Roy. Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, it's curious. And of course, no, the truth is, no actor ever thinks that they can't do comedy. <laughs> Nobody will ever say, we can oh, hear I, the I, huge I just butt don't do that. that. I don't know. But the truth is that um, uh, some, you just, you just know, and uh, within the process of having sat the other side of the audition desk so many times um, and completely losing faith in the fact that what you wrote was ever funny, was ever going to be funny after a day of auditions. All of people who were good, because they don't come through the door unless they're good, because they will be recommended by casting directors. But sometimes the, the colour that they are, and I really mean this, that they, whatever they have, this weird valency that they have, doesn't lock into the character. And consequently, a very truthful, honest performance of a speech will completely iron out any comedy that might have been in there. And... Uh, <laughs> And you are waiting for that, that, that weird cocktail of people who, especially for a play like this, it isn't a farce. They've got to be able to understand that they play the play, not it's the not comedy. Gags, no, it? no, no, it isn't. I can't tell, I can't write. I mean, there's a big sequence in this about a guy who tries to tell a joke, and that guy is me. That's <laughs> much my, uh, that, that's exactly how I'm so appalling at telling jokes. And yet, it's, it, they have to understand where the joke is and where, where the comedy is. And you can't teach that. You either hear that, in the way that somebody who actually wants to sing can, um, and people who sometimes want to sing just cannot, that the ability to hear where the comedy is in the line and retain the honesty of what the line is trying to say is, a, is, a, is quite a rare thing. And so the pool for, if I'm honest, the pool for comedy is not as great as you would think. It isn't as great as you what think. What was so extraordinary watching it last night, not having seen it before, I, I, you know, I missed it then, oh. and I hadn't read it until you know, coming to do this, that they, all four of them, I mean, they're four fabulous performances, you knew exactly who they were. Mm. And actually, you get very little biography mm. about any of them. You know, you know one is married, you know, to Julie, and you know mm -hmm. another one's clearly a bit mm -hmm. bitter and has mm -hmm. been passed over, but these are little... To, you know, they're mm. just sort of sprinkled out yeah. through the play. So there's never the sort of CV. And that's an extraordinary achievement, really. That, that, yeah, well, in a way, that's because you, I, I kind of I feel that you find out more about who four, the four men are in the scene where they try to divide a single sausage <laughs> than you would ever do in screeds of them sitting around talking about what they used to do the office because you're only going to get the same information and the the, the joy the the challenge of, of writing uh, for me is telling the most with the least mm -hmm. it's actually finding the those little shorthands that will ignite huge bushfires of information about a character but it's so short it's such shorthand it's such compression and uh and, use, and, and then the trick, I hope, then is to be able to do that through a comic moment where you, you, you hopefully are laughing, but also mm. through the side door into your pockets, you're smuggling all the, the, the pieces of information about the psyche of these characters and who they are and why they are reacting as they are. But, I mean, it, it, it's a challenge. It must be an enormous challenge for, for you, Angus, as the director, that, for me, I think the play is funny in the way that Beckett is funny. 
that you feel guilty that you're laughing about someone who, you know, you're being told about his recent, you know, yeah, not yeah, very, sure. I'm trying not to spoil anything for those yeah, of you who haven't yeah, seen yeah, it yet. Yeah, yeah. That was a terrific explanation, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, but, but I mean, it's, it's that sort of thing, the awkwardness of the laughing that sort of slightly peters out and how to balance that. I mean, it's... Mm. it's yeah, you try and uh, yeah, you you ho you try and tell, tell the truth about them, and uh, and you do go through this process in in when you're rehearsing a comedy. Is initially you find it very very funny at the read through, but it's laughing, and um, we're laughing. You know they're funny guys, and then you get through it, and everybody's talking about the problems that they have, and maybe how unhappy they are as people. And a lot of um, uh, you know your, your writing has that behind it, which a lot of comedic writing does. And, and certainly Eightbourne, who you've referenced, does. Um, and so you go through a process of, of raising the stakes. You make sure that he really cares about the person that he's... Now I'm trying not to give anything away. Whatever, whatever, they're, whatever they're, 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 they're struggling with in their lives, you make sure they're really struggling with it. And then somehow, through the magic that is whatever... You know, it is when we laugh. And I don't know, I've just been reading Jonathan Lynn's book on comedy where he talks about it being sort of quite animal and stuff. Um, but somehow, the more we try and tell the truth, and, and in some cases, the more... And I don't really talk to, to you about this, because we're, we're talking about various, you know, craft. But the more painful they find the things that they're having to experience, the more funny we can find them, without it being exploitative comedy. And that's a magic little seam which you can mine. And they, as actors turn around to you and go, if you were to say, it'd be funny if you do, you know, if you do a thing, they turn around, especially halfway through rehearsals, and go, my character would never do that. Because actually what he's thinking about is this terrible thing that's happened to him, and then you, but that's what you have to pursue. And then, mm. as you say, and we're, all, we're carefully not referencing anything, but they reveal awful things that have <laughs> happened to them, and everybody laughs. Mm -hmm. And you, you, do you feel guilty? I don't know. You, you, it's a catharsis, it's a release, isn't it? But they on stage have to be taking it very seriously. And the minute they don't, I mean, there are exceptions, like One Man, Two Governors, that Rufus has come out of where they laugh all the time. But even then, they somehow manage to let you know that if that character doesn't get what he's pursuing, it's difficult and painful for him, and then we all laugh. Which makes us feel better about human beings, about being human <laughs> or beings. Or guilty, depending on what you're In like. your case, guilty. In my case, guilty, obviously. Yeah. Um, when we started to talk, and talking mm. about how you know, young you were when you wrote it, and it, mm. you know, right back in the beginning of the 90s, now, there are certain things on the stage that are not, wouldn't have been commonplace in the 90s, 11, certain mobile phones or mm -hmm. whatever. And it did make me think, you know, with the, obviously the David Edgar has been here this mm -hmm. season and the second act was being rewritten and rewritten and rewritten all the way through as, you know, Tell the politics that. were live. Mm -hmm. um, Angus has had more hair before it all started, of course. Um, so when you um, have written something and then 20 years odd or more, you're going back to it, do you look at it and think there are things that are essential about the play, the emotions of the play, the purpose of the play, that need modernising, that I need to slightly change it or move things in? Or How do you deal with that, a, a contemporary work that is actually no longer quite contemporary? Well, the, uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, I was... I, I, after 20, 25 years of coming back to this play, it is a slightly odd thing mm. to come back and look at something that you wrote as a younger man. <clears throat> and... Uh, and part of you is thinking, yeah, well, I, I wouldn't have written yeah. that that way now. And you're having to pull yourself back from saying, but it's, but you know, this worked at the time, and it works in its own right. And if you then try to start fiddling around with it too much, you may absolutely, it will, do, it'll, it will all yeah. just crumble. Um, and uh, and completely accidentally, partly because I, you know, I, the kind of writer that I am, I mean, you, be, you start to realise what that is after you've been writing for a while, and that the things that speak to you most and the things, consequently, that you then address are very particular to you, and I've never been, I've never been a writer who's been interested in or drawn to writing political theatre. My attempts to write social comment theatre where I put the, the theme, I did exactly what this play didn't do and put the theme ahead of the characters, uh, was a terrible disaster. And the play that I wrote, which I thought was frivolous and was purely for a lunchtime entertainment for Alan Aitborn up in Scarborough once, became actually the play that, that the one, that actually, which I premiered here uh, in the tent years and years and years ago, should have been because it was more emotionally honest, because it, the character that I wrote 
to make him funny, as, as per what you were just saying. I really cared about this guy. Yeah. He broke my heart when I started in it, and I just felt so protective towards him. And of course, it was written them with a degree of honesty. It was still a comedy, but it was a comedy that had, I hope, had compassion and care at its core. And that's what this is. And so then, accidentally, the idea that I had was it was set somewhere like this. It was set on a timeless island at a timeless location with timeless trees and rocks and, and, and characteristics of men which have not changed and probably will never, ever change. And when I came back to it, the truth was the only thing that had changed was the, the size of a mobile phone and uh, the characteristics of how a mobile phone behaves. And it stayed uh, in this rather odd beacon right through the life of the play. The only thing that we've ever had to change is how a mobile phone works, not how the heart of a man works, <laughs> not how aspiration or despair or disaster, uh, uh, your emotional calibration of your, where you are in life at that crucial time of reassessment. That is, is as pertinent now as it ever was. And so none of that has none of that has moved, none of that has shifted. And I think that's partly to do with the fact that you take, in the grand history of taking place to islands, the reason that you do that, the reason that you go into the woods, the reason that you go to the islands, is because it becomes a bubble outside the contemporary world. And it's in isolation. And things happen in those places where all bets are off. We're, all, we're denuded. We have, no, we have one thing from the outside world which is a mobile phone, and the rest of it, all the paraphernalia, the contemporary paraphernalia of the office, and all that brings with it, all that security, perversely, is taken away, and it's just you and your cagoule and a sausage. And, <laughs> and how wonderful is that? There is because actually a, a sausage. That isn't mm. some sort of bizarre euphemism. No, there is, no. It's, it's, That's it's the not... bit we're allowed to give away. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah. Is <laughs> there is a sausage. Yeah, don't come hungry. But, so of course, it, I mean, and that's why it does... I mean, you have more than many contemporary playwrights, done more for roles for women. You know, mm. I, I'm sure you all know, of course, Tim wrote Calendar Girls, mm. uh, one of the most um, loved plays here, and of mm. course, m one of the most successful ever touring shows mm. in the mm. West End. So you've put a lot of women's roles mm. on the stage, but it seemed to me that this did need to stay for chaps. Yes, yeah, the, yeah. I, I, it's funny I mean, because- did you ever talk, talk about it? About it. No, 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 it. no, it's funny because you do- Because uh, work has changed. I mean, the environment yeah. in an office in 20 years is not the same, is it? No, and of course, yeah, the only thing that you could potentially do with this play, and I'd be fascinated to know, and I, I think it probably couldn't be done, is, is to do it with four women rather than four men and see what play you were left with. Having the mixture, the way that, and I, I, I'm very well aware as we all know, women and men <laughs> behave differently when in the company of women and men, and you've only got to watch an audience of calendar girls <laughs> to see that, that the, uh, an audience of uh, uh, where, where it was 90% women as opposed to 50% behaved very differently, uh, um, uh, which was fascinating, it was probably a different issue, but actually, certainly on an island, um, there is a play to be written about a mixture of sexes on this island, but it probably would not embrace what this play embraces because there is a lot of testosterone, a lot of masculinity, a lot of peacocking that goes on. And which is, of course, it, which is particularly the hilarious the because they are in cagoules. Because they're in cagoules. And, 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 they don't look very know, masculine. Mostly. And I have to change out of wet clothes within, you know... Before, Under towels. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but, but actually, one of the things that's so clever, I thought, watching it last night, was that it's that sort of sense that there is a tradition within film, particularly, and of course writing, and I f I, I'm interested, Angus, if you did this deliberately, of uh, back to nature, the stripping away, the veneer of civilization, being on an island, you know, that's a, you know, that sort of self-contained world. So their imaginations, like ours, run riot. And I, I mean, I assume you were quite deliberately setting up parallels in the audience's mind of, of things they might have seen or might be thinking about. Mm. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's true on, on two levels. I definitely think there's something that goes through the, the play of, of what would you do if you were stuck on this island and how elemental are you? How, how, how resourceful are you? What are you afraid of? And there's something else which, I, again, I think, I mean, as a director, I, I trained in new writing, so I fundamentally believe that you just look at the play and you keep looking at the play and it tells you. But it's, you know, it starts with guys coming out of the water. It, they end up on this island. They, it's, it wouldn't be a giveaway to say that they go up trees. Um, <laughs> and, and it's impossible not to start. You know, there's some, I mean, you can end up sounding pretentious very, very quickly. 
but there's something about birth going into evolution and actually they're sort of going backwards curiously because they start very civilized and they end up much more primitive and you've even given us um, you know one of them has seen a film about people who get stuck and go back to nature a little bit so and and certainly um, the end which I'm, I absolutely mustn't talk about which very much <laughs> completes that journey so you can you, there's there's a metaphorical power through the whole thing and you know Again, it, the, the trick to directing a comedy isn't to wake up every day thinking, I've got to make this funny. Um, it's, it's, it's also, as well as making it matter, you, there is, there's, a, there's a, a, a beauty through it, which, you know, who, who is, why is it Neville's Island? Is that, what, what's, it, what's the power in negotiating how you run a small community on an island? Why do they all emerge at the start and they immediately change and turn into something else? And, uh, by the end, you've explored lots of sort of ideas. And as you say, you, you explore them with some very short lines and some things which are of their own nature funny. They're not, they're not, they don't appear to be deliberately funny. We laugh at them because of what they're going through. You don't explore them by somebody giving a speech, uh, you know, sections of Paradise Lost or, or its equivalent. But it's all there. And I think, there's a po I think in theatre there's a po poetry of imagery. It's not necessarily about people coming on and speaking poetry. Um, there's the poetry of Tim's stage directions. And, you, you know, as you say, you don't do what Arthur Miller does, which goes, Reverend Paris is this, and goes on for half a page, and you turn over, and he's got one line. You do precisely the opposite. Mm. You know, Gordon is wearing a cagoule, and then he tells us uh, who he is. But you also give us some images which we have faithfully created. I don't think it's recreating them, because we don't know what was in your mind, but you've described it. And it gives you access to, yes, mm. some, some powerful ideas which span something much more than uh, situation and comedy. And I think, uh, I'll be honest, I mean, my, I have a very low boredom threshold uh, in theatre. I'm glad you're still here. Uh, part, and, then, uh, and I kind of feel that I, 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 there's a very simplistic answer to it, partly to why I chose to write this play, is because I thought it would be thrilling in a theatre. I thought it would be thrilling to have an island of people emerge onto the stage through water. I loved that idea, and I thought the challenge of asking people to recreate that, may, for me, it goes to the heart of what theatre is, which is writing this, uh, unlocking the imagination so that an audience sitting there now can see all of this, but also imagine the rest of the Lake District and smell it and have a, a great sensory excitement from feeling you're part of that. And, and that, for me, is why theatre is much closer to my heart and always will yeah, be than yeah. film ever will be, because the unlocking, the mobilisation of that imagination is, is electric for me. And, and I, uh, so many of the things that I, that I write, I realise, I write because you, I write, God, wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be just be yeah. fantastic to see in a theatre, to pull off? It's not necessarily anything as grand as this, but events... The, um, uh, the, the way that you handle time. Or, again, it's, it's a lot, uh, you know, if you look at the, 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 the canon of Alan Akeborn and you look back through what he's done, it's, it's like a kid in a toy shop. You know, he's tried everything. He's tried every single thing on the shelf, of playing around with everything that he's got. Time, space, the, the space, literally. The, uh, and, and, and in a way, I sympathise hugely with that. I just want to be excited. And one of the things, I mean, you probably, you, I couldn't tell when I was in the audience, and I don't know if you can with just a fewer number in here, but not only is the, the sound, the lighting, the design, everything about this so wonderful, but it does smell like Christmas. Mm, mm. There is a really beautiful mm. pine smell mm. sitting here, which must be fabulous every time the actors come on. Um, now, I'm going to take a couple of questions before we give the Playhouse back. Greg. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question about the set design. Uh, I'm wondering whether, the, compared to a traditional built theatre space, um, given that oh, there has been a production here of Barnum before this production, but what were the opportunities created by having an effectively a greenfield site in which to build the foundations for this set? Uh, yeah, um, gosh, yeah. I mean, this was the, the shape you see around the front was a given because uh, obviously the, it takes a, the, designing a seating like, block like this it takes a huge amount of experience. But then beyond that, we spent a lot of time. I mean, the, the height is tremendous. 
And we, the huge amount of debate went into how high we could go. And we went to the Goodwood Estate and cut the trees down. And, <laughs> and we, we, we were saying, I'll give them an Don't cut them too short, because we might want to go higher. Um, and then we've got... I mean, I mean, the answer is immense, because we've done things like we've gone down deep with the water. Somebody told me there's 14 tonnes of water on the set. I don't know if that's an accurate figure. Mm. Um, so it's, we, we, Water Sculptures, which is the company, have created this... Uh, it, it, it can t holds all this water all the way around. There's pond lining. The, 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 the metal frame goes down. Now, you couldn't do that in the festival theatre. You, you, no. <laughs> you do dig out holes in the festival theatre, but you couldn't dig out 40 square metres or whatever I'm standing on. Um, and then beyond that, I suppose there's the, there's the opposite, which is, curiously, being in the middle of the park, we couldn't just turn up with 30 trees and lie them all down in the park. That's against regulations. So they had to turn up three at a time. <laughs> the, the stone, of course, has to come in on a truck, which then has to ride over bits of park, and it's been a bit rainy, and we, you know, people were talking about whether it's going to sink in. So you've got a bit of both. You can, you can certainly push the margins up, down, left, right, all over the place, uh, but, but then you've got to... The weight of this set must be enormous. So, but, you know, obviously, Dan Watkins and, 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 and Ed, who's the production manager, have magic ways to work out that we're not actually going to sink the whole thing into the ground. <laughs> Is there another question? Kay? I wanted to ask, um, was there ever a feeling that this might be too big a space for this play? Mm. I mean, obviously you overcome that, but those of us that book many times <laughs> to come to a theatre and book for barn then thought, couldn't imagine, I mean, we all knew what would happen for barn, but we couldn't imagine play in this space. No, no, we did, absolutely. It was frightening. I mean, well, when it was bare, it was horrific. Yeah. When we came in here and it was, they'd just taken Barnum down and, you know, it's high and it's, it's deep and, um, and it wasn't as much this, I don't know what, it wasn't as much the stage because, of course, in a way, is this stage roughly the footprint of the... Yeah, it's close. Bigger. So that, it's interesting you say that because I didn't feel like when I walked in to see Calendar Girls, in the, in the other place, I didn't feel it was, it was going to be dwarfed. But there's something about that extra row and the height and, and the depth of it mm. that felt as though there was a danger. Even though the play is about four people being dwarfed and overpowered by nature, mm. which, is the, which would have got us out of that hole slightly. But it's still, if a place feels cold and they don't fill the stage, it's going to feel very um, uh, exposed. And I think what cleverly what has been done is that it actually feels perversely incredibly warm. Uh, the height of the trees is sort of like protecting hands and the, the, the whole thing feels as though it's been forced forward from the, barn, from the back wall of the Barnum set. And also, the main thing to get over, which, which, is, which is different from the other place, is the height of the stage, so that you, it feels yeah. as though there's always a slight difference looking that way than everybody crowding round, that kind of crucible feel. But even so, I, the whole place feels warm to me, and I can't quite mm. put my finger on why, uh, why that is. Um, but I think it's to do with the sense that the actors are pushed forward by these loving hands, the natural hands of the trees. And so at once they're being threatened, but also protected by them. And so it, I watched them the other night, and, and, and it was just, they, they completely filled the space. Mm. For me, I, I, I think that that that's also. I was the same. K. I thought four people on a stage. That's going to be an ask. Mm. But because of the way it's been directed, mm. and because it is such an exceptionally um, accomplished ensemble. I mean, every single person yes. who speaks, you think, God, they're good. Yeah. And yeah. then the next person, then Tim speaks, then yes. Aid speaks, then Rufus speaks, then John speaks, and you think each of them. And it's mobile. There's a lot happening. They they have to contend with a lot of movement. There's a lot of props. There's a lot of incident. Uh, which I think keep it busy, and I think what, the, what has been so, so laudable about the production is that it's kept it moving. It hasn't kept static, I think partly because you're aware that you have to deal with people on more than 180 degrees. What Angus has done very well, and I think they've responded to, is, is to keep the sense of, uh, of animals pacing each other in a ring, uh, which happens all the, you know, right the way through it. Not too much that it feels... Uh, that you're stuck on a record player, but, you, but it's mobile enough yeah. when you need it to be, and that's, that keeps the whole thing warm. It keeps it like a walk. You know? 
Well, on the question of pace, we, we must give the, uh, the playhouse back to the players. Um, the, uh, uh, there is always, as you know, an afterwards, um, so a discussion after the show is finished um, on each play. Um, it will be on the 23rd of September for Neville's Island. It's in here. You don't have to have come to the show that night, but you do have to just get a ticket, so health and safety and all of those sorts of things. Uh, there's also a, a from page to uh, stage, which is explaining exactly how it goes from being words on a page that Tim's written to what Angus has, has, has um, put before you, and that's on the 26th of September. I will be back doing a pre-performance interview in the Minerva on Monday uh, for another country with Jeremy Heron, who is the director of that. Um, but I think the last thing I'm going to say before we leave is, actually, I'm going to say two things. Firstly, don't forget that the season isn't entirely over just once Neville's Island is opened and another country's opened because Angus is directing King Lear. That will be a quite extraordinary experience to have here, um, really great actor here. And that will be uh, starting at the end of October. Do you start your run? Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah. never mind. Look on start the website. November, yeah. yeah, beginning of November. Angus doesn't know. He's, he, you know. Um, but don't forget that. So the season's going on for longer. And also, any of you who want to know quite how wonderful this is, um, if you haven't seen it yet, if you go onto the CFT website and see the cast talking about this play. It is one of those BAFTA-winning type <laughs> films. It is absolutely hilarious and captures everything that I think you both, between you, achieved with this extraordinary play. So, ladies and gentlemen, Angus Jackson and Tim Fur. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>